Hi, this is Gurusi Singh and you're watching My Thick Accent Podcast. In the intricate journey of international students, there exists a point of no return. a critical juncture where the process of adaptation transcends being merely a choice it becomes a fundamental necessity this journey demands more than adaptation it requires a transformation a conscious reshaping of one's identity to align with the contours of the new cultural landscape picture this you arrive in a foreign land eager but somewhat alien to the nuances that define the local culture As a national student, assimilation isn't just about attending classes, it's a holistic endeavor. You adjust your speech to match the cadence of your peers, sand off rough edges deemed unconventional, and perhaps unintentionally temper your ambitions to fit the prevailing expectations. Every step, every adaptation is an intricate dance with societal expectations, a perpetual negotiation between preserving your essence and conforming to the norms of your new reality. Yet, Amidst this ongoing metamorphosis there comes a moment of reckoning a moment when you stand before a mirror and realize that the reflection staring back at you seems like a distant echo of your former self the amalgamation of cultural assimilation societal pressures and the sheer weight of navigating a new world reshapes not only your external persona but also the very core of your being our guest today intimately understands the struggle Having traversed the challenging terrain of international student life, he has grappled with the complexities of self-transformation. In our conversation, we delve into the soul-searching that defines the immigrant experience. Our guest narrative mirrors the profound odyssey undertaken by countless international students, the sacrifices made, the compromises forged, and the indomitable resilience that emerges from navigating the paths of a new world. Let us unravel the stories, the layers of his stories, a story that encapsulates the universal essence of the immigrant experience and in doing so echoes the shared aspirations, struggles and the triumphs of an entire community striving to find a place in the intricate mosaic of a foreign land. Please welcome Simran Jeet Singh. Hi Gracies, I'm really happy to be here. and a really well written introduction i think you really tried to capture the uh essence of what that you know uh experience is like for all international students um and really really well written as a, as you were kind of going off i was i was almost reminded of you know what it it was like for me coming back all these years um and uh and really excited to be sharing my story and uh, a very good morning to all of your listeners Awesome. No, welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Indeed. And I like I mentioned to you before our recording, I really related with your story, you know, mm-hmm. being uh, from the parts of the similar country, and that's why I'm really excited to have you and let's just get into it. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So in this season of our podcast, Indeed, I have uh, this new segment which is basically about turning up the fun factor a little bit. So I'm going to okay. start by asking you a little bit of some fun questions. So, ready? Absolutely. Okay. So first is what's your go-to breakfast? Uh my go-to breakfast uh I would say it's it's evolved to be something really simple, something that I can fix mm-hmm. fairly quickly. Um as life has gotten busy, as work has gotten busy, I yeah. tend to rely upon a simple toast with some s- scrambled egg. It's probably my go-to on most days. Um mm-hmm. and then there are other days when I skip it entirely and go for like a black coffee in the morning um but there are uh there are less days of on the coffee side more days on the reasonably healthy breakfast side okay yeah. and do you did you also used to not drink coffee before coming to canada or were you like always like a coffee person i was actually never a hot beverage person growing up in okay. india like uh my, my family does indulge um in a lot of tea drinking um mm-hmm. so does my wife and her side of the family as well but growing mm-hmm. up i never um had tea or chai as we know it back home mm-hmm. um yeah. or coffee it was just something that i think it, it was a habit that was cultivated in the first couple of years of my coming to canada as a student long hours 
uh, yeah. you know, like <laughs> studying and everything. And that's where the whole thing. And then the Tim Hortons kind of addiction kicked in. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. I think it was very similar for me. I think I didn't even ever used to drink tea as well. You know, my parents right. would love it. My family would love tea, but I was just never a fan. Until right. I came here, it wasn't only the tea. I just fell in love with coffee, you can say. <laughs> and also it's like, you know, again, adapting to a new culture and you see your peers, your classmates, mm-hmm. your colleagues drinking coffee and you end up like trying once or twice and then you're hooked to it forever. Exactly. <laughs> and then you become coffee snobs. At least I yeah. have kind of become a bit of a coffee snob. Um, mm. I really like my coffee done a certain way. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay. So my next question is, uh, share a favorite song or a dialogue or a movie and tell us like why it's significant to you. Something that I've been listening to a lot, um, you know, off late has been, um, there was this movie that came out, I think, uh, early 2023. It was released on mm-hmm. Netflix. It's an Indian movie called Kala. It's, okay. it's, about, yes. uh, yeah. it's about a story of... Uh, uh, of, of a girl who's born in a you know music family, but she's not really allowed to pursue music. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a song in that movie, "Bikhadne Ka Mujhko Shock Hai Yes, yeah. beautiful, beautifully written song, uh, beautifully composed, and that's something that I have been going back to quite a lot uh, mm. for some reason uh, the past couple of days. So that's gonna probably be it. Yeah. yeah. No, good choice. It's actually been my, one of those favorite songs, you know, and funny enough, this morning, it was just part of my playlist while I was just getting ready and it did pop up. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. That's amazing. Really good album. I really like Amit Trivedi as a music composer. Um, Like, again, I am very particular about my music. I think music Mm -hmm. for me is something that really sets my mood. It's something Mm -hmm. that I copiously consume, Uh, you know, throughout the day. It really impacts, you know, the way that I think the way that I go about my days. Yeah. Um, it fills up a lot of silences in my life. So I'm very mm-hmm. particular about the kind of songs that I listen to. And uh, I'm actually pretty diverse with the kind of songs that I listen to. Like there's no one, I, I have a preferred genre definitely, but yeah. um, I've tried over the past couple of years and kudos to my younger sister because she she's amazing with her music for having introduced mm-hmm. some really amazing songs in my uh, in my playlist. But yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. Music for me is one of those things that really helps me connect with people as well. Mm, uh, okay. Oftentimes I feel that if, you know, uh, there's somebody who mentions a song and they like that song and I happen to like the same song, it just helps break the ice a lot more. So mm. uh, that to me is a really powerful, uh, uh, you know, tool to kind of like connect with people. So interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, I think sometimes it becomes like a conversation starter also, you know, maybe like yeah. a certain song or a certain movie, you mm-hmm. know, end up like talking more and more about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is, if you could teleport back to a particular place from your home country for a day, where would it be and what would you do? I, I'm currently in Kitchener, Ontario. Um, if I could teleport for a day, I'd probably say um, any any mountain in, in, in mm-hmm. India. Uh, mountains have always fascinated me a lot more than beaches have um, and uh, I don't know like the silence the the beauty I think mm. uh, so I would probably say somewhere around Kailash is going to be one of those places that has been on my um, it's it's been on my bucket list for a really long time I'm trying to figure out what that process will look like uh, mm-hmm. to be able to embark on that so maybe I'm going to use your suggestion your your offer of teleporting there uh <laughs> to save me some bucks but yeah that's gonna be my answer Kela. okay great great answer loved it and lastly if you could teach one phrase or any saying in your mother tongue and what would it be and what does it mean oh that's interesting uh it actually makes me your question actually makes me pause for a little bit and make me think about my mother tongue as well because that's such a loaded thing right <laughs> yeah um I, I was born in new delhi india and uh, i was born in a family where like i'm born in a sikh punjabi family um so technically my mother tongue should be punjabi yeah uh, but my mother was born in ranchi jharkhand in india 
which okay. her mother tongue growing up was actually Hindi. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so it's it's kind of like a different mix of languages that I've grown up around, in which I have spoken to my parents in either English or Hindi. Um, they have spoken with each other in Punjabi. So mm. it, it's kind of like a really. <laughs> so your question almost makes me pause and almost think about what exactly is my mother tongue to begin with. Yeah. Um, but coming back to your question, um, I won't really like again. I don't think uh, maybe I'm you know digressing from the question a bit. But one phrase, um, you know, in 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 Hindi that has like that that has stayed with me, and this is something that. Uh, my dad used to used to say quite a lot, you know, when I was growing up, um, is Sangharshi Jivana. Mm. Um, again, that's a really loaded phrase. Um, a lot of kind of subtext in there, but um, uh, it's it's something that I think uh, he had picked up from, uh, I think, an interview or something that he had heard of Amitabh Bachchan talking to his own father, Harivan Shai Bachchan. He was not yeah. really doing that well. Amitabh Bachchan was just kind of breaking into movies, but not nothing was working for him. And he went to his dad, uh, Harivan Shai Bachchan, the great poet. Um, and he told his dad, ki, bahut hai mein. And that's what mm-hmm. Harivan Shai Bachchan told him. Ki hai. And that's something okay. that, you know, my dad has used many times in my, has kind of like communicated that to me many times in my life. And it's definitely something which has impacted the way that I think about life, the way that mm-hmm. I approach challenges, the way that I think about um, grit, determination, and what really it takes. So uh, that's probably, a fr- it's not really a phrase, uh, but it's just something that popped up in my mind the first time that you, yeah, mm. uh, in response okay. to your question. And how would you translate it for the non-Hindi speakers? Uh, I think it's going to be really poor translating it because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was trying uh, to think about it. I'm not able to gather my words. <laughs> just because I think, you know, a, a lot of it is going to get lost in translation, to be honest. You, you really, yeah. there, there are certain phrases, uh, there, there are certain kind of sayings in certain languages that when you translate it to another language, they really lose their essence. Absolutely. Um, but a very poor translation could probably be that the real essence of life is struggling and overcoming challenges right mm. um that's going to be a very poor translation but um i don't think it quite fully captures what the initial kind of intention of the phrase is um but yeah i'm going to leave it at that no i think i think definitely made sense yeah okay. <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. okay since you talked about you know delhi and your family let's talk a bit more about that let me take you back to the time you spent in india Tell us a little bit about your formative years and how was it like just growing up there? Um, I spent 17 years of my life in India. I moved to Canada when I was 17 um, for my undergraduate education. But in terms of my formative years, I was born and brought up in New Delhi. Um, I was born in a family, you know, in, in, in a joint family. So for mm-hmm. you know your listeners who are not really familiar with that concept, it's basically in which there's a... Uh, like all the different family members, you know, including your brothers, like more on the, you know, father's side of the family, because mm-hmm. again, patriarchy is very much alive and real in India still, um, as as mm-hmm. it is in other parts of the world. Um, so a joint family system is one in which, you know, I grew up with my uncles and aunts, uh, you know, under the same roof. Um, and that was, I think, for the first couple of years. Um, and then we kind of like, each of us kind of became our own unit when I think I was four or five years old, uh, but grew up in a family that, you know, um, that was a business class family, which meant that they were um, into the whole business side of things. It's a business that my grandfather had actually started when he had retired from the Indian Air Force mm-hmm. and that my um, uh, dad's older brother, my dad, and then my dad's younger brother, the three of them, you know, eventually um were absorbed into um growing up i think i really fond memories of delhi because the delhi that i grew up in in the early 90s the schools that i went to Mm -hmm. the kind of community the kind of uh, um the word that i'm looking for here is mohalla Mm. uh, which is again a poor translation for some of your listeners will be like a neighborhood (laughs) but a mohalla is a very um it's kind of like an indian concept in which it's, it's a neighborhood but you know, Indian it's more like a feeling, less of it's a more word. like a feel. Exactly, <laughs> it's 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 a really 
it's, it's a neighborhood where everyone knows everyone. It's kind of like a more mm. community community setting in which, sure, people are living in individual houses, but uh, they're very intimately involved in each other's lives. You know, kids are playing together in the evening. They grow up together. Um, a lot of, I think, um, people that you see around, you know, like your neighbors and all are they're basically they become like your extended family so that was a that was a really interesting feeling that i grew up on that i remember of my early time in delhi other than that i would say it was a it was really uh it was a sheltered childhood is how i would probably put it um i come from i think an upper middle class family uh, Mm -hmm. which you know eventually started doing okay uh you know at a time when i kind of hit my teens but I still do remember, you know, times, at least from my life, early life, growing up, there was a bit of a struggle with finances, money was tight in a couple of situations. But but yeah, like really fond memories of Delhi, the Delhi winters, which are, you know, really yeah. famous. Um, yeah. Delhi is, I think, one of those cities which kind of gets to see the extremes of the weather. So mm-hmm. your summers are, you know, 45 plus degrees oh, yeah. Celsius, and then your winters end up going down to like one or two degrees you get the monsoon, you get the spring, you get the fall and autumn as well. So and I, I grew up in North Delhi and very, very close to the Delhi University. Memories of the food, the people, feeling in the air of what the 90s and the early 2000s were all about. Yeah. Well, what, what the focus was on growing up? Was it like you have to get a job or was it like was it like more into entrepreneurship? What was it like? I think I, I, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, parents who were fairly flexible um, and open-minded to kind of like have me figure what I wanted to do okay. and, uh, you know, support me in that sense. It also definitely helped that I was able to figure out what I wanted to do, what my love was, what I really wanted to focus on quite early in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think just a bit of context and background to some of your listeners maybe, but a lot of business class families in India as they it's 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 a multi-generational thing right mm-hmm. so your grandfather started something up uh your parents generation continued it and built upon it and then the expectation as again uh from a patriarchy standpoint and i since i was the you know oldest son in the mm-hmm. joint family the expectation was that i and then you know other of my cousin brothers will eventually you know join it and grow it even further Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of like a cookie cutter template that ends up, I think, being reinforced by mm. the family, the society, people around you, your relatives, your extended family, everyone. Um, and it's it's very much so among the Punjabi people in North India. I think that's a that that's that's kind of like what the trend has been. I was lucky enough to kind of have my parents who didn't really subscribe to that. Like when I think about it, I think I kind of know the reasons why they probably didn't want to, you know, subscribe to that. Like my dad, he is a lawyer by training. He Mm -hmm. went to Delhi Faculty of Law. He read law. He has a master's in political science and he wanted to, you know, get into uh, the field and become a judge Mm -hmm. in in, in the high court in India. And he, because of financial constraints, he never really got to do that he had to eventually get absorbed into the family business. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I, I think, you know, part of it part of it for him was that, okay, maybe I had to do that. I had to do these sacrifices, but I want uh, my kids to um, not really be bound, you know, by their parents' expectations. So I think that was one. Uh, my mother, again, huge, huge kudos to her for really giving me the wings to fly really instilling in me that self-belief and that confidence from a very early age that Mm -hmm. um, I could really go after and achieve whatever I set my heart and mind to. So Mm -hmm. she really kind of gave me that space and really pushed me to, you know, try different things. Um, Like the approach very much at home was that, you know, you want to get into sports? Sure, let's, you know, go try it out. Um, You want to do something, you know, academically? Again, go try it out. There was no limitations. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, uh, it was, it was. I think I've been really fortunate and blessed to have had that kind of um, really like no pressures. It was more, I think, on me 
to figure it out. But um, it, it was still, I would say, sheltered in a way because I think every parent at the end of the day, they, they want the best for their kids. And uh, uh, going, like, you know, growing up, you know, in the sometimes like the confines of the house, uh, not really, um, I think they were also a bit protective slash mm-hmm. overprotective in a couple of different yeah. uh, ways in which, um, uh, so I think that's a reason why I think it was a lot sheltered. And again, for me, I realized that it was a really sheltered childhood when I actually got to see the other side when I came out, right? Mm. So I really got to see the, you know, the reality of life, you know, having starting to live on my live by myself uh, starting at 17 to really go back and think that, okay, that was a really sheltered childhood. Um, yeah. uh, it was, it was more of, you know, like a thing yeah. in retrospect, but anyway. Yeah. No, I can, uh, I can actually relate to a lot of points you have mentioned, Simran. And, you know, one thing you mentioned earlier, you were talking about when talking about your family is you use the word, you know, patriarchy. And right. I think this is a topic which I've discussed at multiple points on the podcast and the, mm-hmm. the listener who are religious list of the podcast, they know I asked this question to some of our guests and I think I will ask you this. So growing up, you know, I grew up in a patriarchal household. I was taught that certain things which are taught to all mm-hmm. of us, you know, mm-hmm. like men don't cry, be a man is the task of the right. week, you know, you're not supposed to show your vulnerable side to people. Right. A lot of these factors are kind of like instilled this, uh, in us and uh, honestly, I don't blame them because that was something which was taught to them growing up and they just tried to pass on what was they think is correct. Mm-hmm. And But we, when, how, when we guys, you know, we moved abroad, we got mm-hmm. exposed to a world which is beyond internet you know mm-hmm. our parents can't even think about this th- something mm-hmm. which is internet you know they can't even fathom mm-hmm. the fact there's something which lets you connect with people like in a click you know it's a lot of like mm-hmm. these factors mm-hmm. came in and then you come here you start living on your own and then you start realizing that maybe the things that were taught to me maybe i need to shed those because they're not serving yeah. me anymore you know but i want to have a question to you is that did any point you know, even like maybe a movie after moving to Canada or even like while you were in India, what right. kind of impact that patriarchy had on you growing up? Um, that's a really interesting question. And let me just first kind of echo some, you know, a little bit of what you said, and then I'm going to delve into mm-hmm. this question. And I think it probably will answer a part of your question. Um, but when we think about patriarchy, I think it's uh, like... Ob- I, I think there are different layers of patriarchy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a more obvious part, you know, the more surface level thing in which um, if I go and ask someone, do you think that, you know, a man, a woman, and then somebody who might identify as queer, um, mm-hmm. do they do they deserve to be treated differently? And I think mm-hmm. I'm guessing most well-meaning people are going to say, no, they deserve to be treated the same. But that's a surface level patriarchy part of yep. it. A lot of times, you know, the way we think about life, the way we think about relationships, a lot of subliminal things um, that impact our worldview, um, they have been shaped by patriarchy. They have been shaped by the um, environment that we grew up in. And, why, and, you know, while we might actually feel that we've unlearned a lot of it and that we're really fair and that we don't believe in patriarchy, um, I think the idea is to catch yourself at different you know times and actually see that you know it's it might have been a very faint uh, mm. you know way that pa- that that patriarchy might have seeped into your way of thinking so yeah. um, at least for me um, I I grew up in a family which was a very man's man you know you gotta be yeah um, you know like an alpha etc 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 and uh, again it might not have been communicated by my parents in that clear language yeah there was always those undertones there was it was something that was very latent um in the way they um looked at life in the way they expected you know like a man to show up and provide and uh again i not to say that i feel that you know men don't have that duty they do um i I heavily believe that but it's not just you know limited to them in their capacity as a man it's limited in, to their capacity as a human being to be able to provide, mm-hmm. to be accountable, um, just as it is for a woman or for somebody who identifies um, as a queer. Um, so 
I had to do a lot of that unlearning on my own, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I came here. And to me, I look at that a little differently. For me, it was not so much, you know, me coming into a Western, you know, country that maybe, you know, on the surface of it had maybe more liberal values mm -hmm. uh, that pushed me to do it. I think in my case, it was really moving away from home moving away mm -hmm. from that noise, um, really living by myself and having that time to... Um, introspect also. Introspect, you know, pick up these kind of loaded questions. And I think I've been really fortunate to have started, you know, to be able to do that at 17, in mm -hmm. which a lot of... It, it was just not about um, patriarchy. It was about spirituality. It was about, mm -hmm. you know, my understanding of, you know, life or, you know, what exactly my purpose is in life. These really loaded questions... I got a lot of time by myself to think about it um, mm. and actually be that, okay, like, and, and it started to kind of become clear that, okay, this is what I may have been taught. This is, you know, my parents' voice in my head when I think about, you know, this question, but what exactly is my voice on this? Have I thought mm -hmm. about it? What exactly are the different facets of, you know, this question? So similarly to patriarchy, I think, um, I just kind of had that time. I had those experiences. I really had that, um, uh, I had that opportunity to meet people from you know different walks of life uh, who grew up in a way that was very different than mine. To mm. really start to actually analyze that, okay, like what exactly does equality mean? What exactly does justice mean? What equal, like what exactly does it mean to treat people the same way? Right? Absolutely. Because. Again, discrimination, as I said, like patriarchy, it's 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 a, it's a really layered com it's a really layered complex thing. It doesn't just work mm -hmm. as you know you can't sit here. Uh, the way that we understand we typically understand discrimination that is a part of it, sure. But I think in yeah. today's day and age, where people again, that's my understanding, and that's how I like to look at the world. I like to look at the best in people, but I still feel that there are times when these things need to be checked. People need to introspect a bit more. And mm. really need to kind of think through their positions on issues. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people have done a lot of that original thinking. And I think to me, that's truly a measure of how much growth an individual has had. Um, you know, really like having thought about things and issues individually to say that, okay, mm -hmm. this is who I am as a person. I think that really builds character. I really think that builds identity. Otherwise, you'll mm -hmm. just end up living a cookie cutter version of somebody else's conception of what life for you is meant to be like. Mm -hmm. right? But ha but have you or would you call out if you actually witness such sort of situation? Absolutely, and really? I think I've done that in a lot of different uh, instances. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I, for me, um, I very strongly believe, and I think a lot of this comes from you know um, my faith. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a practicing Sikh. Yeah. Um, I have. A, I'm a very visible minority. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I have a turban on my head. Uh, I keep a beard. Um, and uh, there have been instances when you know I have been treated differently. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been instances where I've seen other people being treated differently, and I think for me it has been a lot easier to relate to their struggles because their struggles have been my struggles. And I just feel that, you know, if life has, you know, uh, brought me to a point where I feel empowered enough to go about life mm. and live it on my own terms, um, yeah. I need to pay it forward. Absolutely. So I need to pay that empowerment forward. So if uh, it, it can be anything, like uh, not to go into specific examples, but sure. it can be, you know, like calling out somebody who is being treated differently on the subway or somebody mm. who's being treated differently at your workplace. Um, because I think it, it really goes back to my fundamental belief that a everyone needs to be like deserves to be treated with respect. That needs to mm -hmm. be the default. And then we kind of get into the questions of their conduct and, you know, the pros and cons and, you know, other things, but at the very basic minimum level, that is a, that like that, ne that needs to be the baseline. So, um, and I just feel, you know, my hope has always been that because there have other, there have been other people in my life who have called stuff out on my behalf when I didn't mm. have the words, when I did not feel powerful enough and I was trying to find my voice. 
And I really like, I'm, I'm, I remember their names. I remember those people. And I'm so glad that they had it in them at that time to, uh, you know, stand up for me. And I just <laughs> feel that if I can pay it forward, I'm just hoping that, you know, we just end up becoming a better community um, overall. But yeah, that's, that's, that's how I understand that. No, perfect. I think I loved it. And once again, I think I resonate with everything you have said, being once again, you know, being the follower of the similar faith that such, mm. such kind of like certain, certain teachings also kind of come up and you start like uh, practicing them throughout your life. So I completely relate what you're saying. So now I would like to pivot towards your move to Canada. Tell us a little bit about, briefly about the decision to move to Canada. How was the process for you like? And also another thing I want to add to this is, like, I also come from a joint family and it was really hard for me to uproot myself from a joint mm-hmm. family setting. And I feel like I never felt the need to have friends because I feel like my huge family, we were like 15 people living in the same house, was my right. was my friends and family and everything. I was very close right. to my cousins, very close to my siblings. And then obviously the extended families come in between, mm-hmm. right? You have your uncles and aunts and chatties and buas and all those people come in and a small birthday party is also like 50 people at times, you know? Right. So <laughs> so I think uprooting from that, coming mm-hmm. to this new world, tell me how mm-hmm. was it for you like? Sure. Uh, so you asked a couple of questions there. Um, let's first talk about the decision to move to Canada. Now, yeah. I moved to Canada in 2011 uh, when I when it was not all the rage among a lot of people in India to move to Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, I was originally planning to go to either the US or UK. um, And uh, Canada just happened to have, um, you know, a better kind of scholarship for me. And I was Mm -hmm. always very mindful of uh, trying to become financially independent as soon as I could. Um, So that was kind of like the reason for me that I wanted to move to Canada. But I think it uh, begs another question that why didn't I want to move out of India in the first place? Mm. Um, there, there are two things there. I think um, the first part was, at least in my case, um, I very early on in my life kind of found that um, I wanted to do something for the community. Like mm-hmm. that for me was what I think my calling was. Um, I never really found myself fitting well into you know the business that my family was running that I was almost kind of like being in some ways groomed to take over um Mm -hmm. uh, I actually want to credit my uncle on my mother's side for um you know he he he'd taken me to uh so this is in on my nani's side which is my grandmother I was Mm -hmm. visiting her one of the summers I think I was probably 11 years old and um my uncle, along with a couple of his friends, they had taken me, I don't know why, like an 11-year-old kid with a couple of men, mm-hmm. uh, to uh, this swearing-in ceremony of uh, ceremony of this uh, chief minister, right? So okay. uh, I probably saw like thousands and thousands of people. I saw like that stage with, you know, somebody on the stage. And uh, to me, it was really powerful. I think at that point in time, as a kid, I was really fascinated by, you know, somebody on stage who was swearing in and all these, you know, people who were there believing that this person had the power to change their lives. Mm. Um, And what I kind of took from that was that, okay, maybe policy, maybe politics, maybe doing something for the community through this, like through this kind of channel, this avenue is the fastest way for me to make an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to me, I kind of like started to kind of figure out that, okay, maybe this is something that I want to do. This is something that I genuinely feel drawn to. And, uh, um, as you probably know, uh, India is not the most, um, friendly in terms of, you know, people who want to make a career in public service, right. Mm. Uh, especially people who want to get into politics. Uh, not that at that time I kind of had figured out that I wanted to go down that path, but, um, in India, it's still very much of, you know, how much money you have, um, you know, to spend, you know, there's like a dynasty kind of a thing in families in which, you know, there's a certain 
kind of like class of people that can only get into politics. It's not really open. It's not really based on merit. At least it was not, uh, you know, when I was growing up. So my conception was uh, that, you know, if, if I want to do something uh, really for people, and at that point in time, it was not so much that, okay, it has to be for the people that I grew up with. It just was, you yeah. know, like as a kid, I was not think I was not putting those boxes on top of this to contain this. To me, it was like, I want to do something for the people. And uh, how do I go about it? And uh, I think my mother was probably like, hey, if you want to go down this path, <laughs> you're not doing it in India because it's not safe. Um, so I think that was the first time that I think this thought mm. came in my mind that, okay, I want to go down this path. The second thing was growing up, there was no um, uh, there was no way to kind of get into the public policy, public service kind of a thing. There is a examination in India, UPSC, but there are millions of people who, you know, like take that exam. Absolutely. And again, it's, they end up becoming a part of a public service, but it's not really more policy oriented. So to me, uh, I was like, okay, I want to get into those like nutty topics and I might have to go and, you know, uh, get that education outside. Uh, definitely acknowledging my privilege as well in all of this, because I think at that point in time, my family definitely had the means to, for me to even be able to think that I could yeah. go out and get that education. So again, really been fortunate on that end as well. Um, so anyway, I, that's, you know, that's how the whole process started in my head that, okay, I want to go out um, and, uh, you know, I want to delve into these topics and I want to live by myself and I want to, you know, <laughs> a bit of that self-discovery journey also started. And for me, it was not so much about, okay, I'm only going to go to Canada. I had given my SATs, I'd given my other kind of exams that at that time you had to give for the, for the United States, for UK. Um, yeah. But it just so happened to be the case that the, finances in my mind worked the best if I came to Canada so that's how I kind of landed here um, uh, the other point that you touched on in your question was how uh, you felt uprooted when you had to <laughs> leave your joint family to come here for yeah. me I think the experience was a little different um, mm -hmm. I did grow up in a joint family for the first couple of years in my life but we had kind of like started living as a nuclear family after so okay. um, and um I, I was not necessarily on the, you know, like best terms with, you know, my dad's side of the family, like, okay. like people were still working together. The business was still going on, but um, there, there was no kind of like that sense of loss that I experienced when I moved out. Um, hmm. um, rather, I think for me, it was more about leaving that sheltered, you know, atmosphere in my home, you know, with my mm -hmm. younger sister and my, and, and my parents, um, that was a bit of a struggle. Um, but definitely, I think, but you kind of hit the nail on its head in that the underlying sentiment, the underlying feeling of being uprooted, um, it's, it's, it's huge. I think it's really dense as a feeling. Um, and it only takes for someone to have taken that leap of faith to really realize what that feeling entails, right? Because mm -hmm. you, and especially, I think it's a lot more profound for somebody who is doing that at the age of 17, who's kind of grown up in a really, and there are a lot of other people, you know, who came as international students with me at that age, in which, you know, you really grew up in a really sheltered home. Uh, everything is kind of like made available to you. And then at 17, you're basically like, okay, uh, you're going to the West. And the fastest that we can reach you is probably in 24 hours. If we take the next flight out, <laughs> it's still going to take a day for us to reach you. Um, but, you know, you as a kid are basically sent to figure life out. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's when you, I think when, when you, when you move and then when you kind of start to encounter challenges, when life starts to happen to you, that's when the sense of loss starts to kind of like settle in that, mm -hmm. you know what? now is probably like I could I need my family or I need my loved ones around me to kind of like share the burden with me yeah um, but everybody kind of I think experiences that loss in different ways um, not to say that people who move in later in their life in their 20s don't experience that or maybe experience it less I think everyone is different um, everyone's attachment patterns are different everyone has had different life circumstances and experiences but I think a common thread among everyone's experience as an immigrant when you move out is that sense of loss. Um, mm. Where you just kind of realize that 
um, at the very least, you know, in India or wherever, you know, people are, um, wherever they grew up, they, 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 they still had that sense of community. They had the sense of family, but now it's all upon themselves to figure life out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, you just I just love how sometimes sometimes you define certain things and I'm just amazed that you are so you always find the correct words to say it and initially when you were talking about getting to this career you said you know the person on the stage swearing uh and then the people who are watching him like they like you said you know they believe that okay this guy has the power to change the decision. I love how like you just said that. You no, know, it's like a, a, a I mean, everybody can see that, but again, like just defining it the way you did, I really like that part. Um, mm-hmm. And the other aspect you really touched upon is, uh, which if I, you know, reflect on that myself also, that you said that your family, you said that you, you feel privileged. You see now that you are privileged, that your family was even able to think about sending you abroad because they had the means to do it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's very... Um, underrated you know you just mm-hmm. don't consider it in that particular mm-hmm. moment that you're able to do mm-hmm. that up until mm-hmm. later on you reflect on it and realize that um but moving on let's just you know get more into your international student life you sure. stayed in windsor you came to do your uh, masters you came to study economics and not the masters you came to study economics and political science right so that's about yes. the international student um uh experience and how was it like just in the class as well i remember having conversation with you regarding uh you know not enough people get certain kind of courses you know it's usually the the general courses are maybe the it or some other mm-hmm. kinds and nothing mm-hmm. nothing's wrong in that but tell me more about that yeah for sure uh so uh came, came to windsor in 2011 um windsor at that time i remember um you know, even now when somebody asks me uh, where your hometown is, uh, the first thought that comes to mind is Windsor, and not New Delhi. <laughs> and the reason is, and the reason why Windsor holds such a special place in my heart is because that's really where I started to get more in touch with my own self, where I really started to, as I said, um, engage in those heavy-duty topics to really start to understand life. Uh, I really had that space to grow up. Um, but yeah, Coming in at 2011, it was, I think, a couple of years after the 2008 financial crisis. So Mm -hmm. uh, Windsor, which is, you know, uh, a city right on the border with uh, Detroit in the U.S., uh, it's kind of like that automotive city. That's where a lot of the, uh, you know, automobile companies are, the Chryslers, the Fords and others. So because that financial crash had happened and the automotive industry had been uh, totally decimated by that crash. Uh, the ripple effects were felt in Windsor as well, in which most mm-hmm. of the folks who lived in that city used to work in those plants, they used to cross the border, go work in those plants, come back. Mm-hmm. And then when those plants closed down, um, it just ended up impacting the local economy of the city as well. So the Windsor, the way people remember it today, is very different uh, than what it was in 2011. It was still kind of starting to find its feet after the 2008 financial crisis. But anyway, uh, there I was. Uh, I, I still remember, I think it was August 30, 30th or something that I, I reached Windsor 2011. Um, and to me, I think the first thing that kind of came to mind for me was that this air smells really different. Right? <laughs> that was the first thought that came to mind that yeah. uh, this is unusual. I woke up in the morning and it took me a bit of a a couple of minutes to kind of uh, just orient myself as to, you know, where exactly am I? Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, I think everything was new. Uh, I, I was living, uh, like I was living in the student dorm. I was mm-hmm. sharing, you know, my room with someone um, who happened to be from a different culture altogether. Mm. Um, and um, that was, I think every single experience that happened since I landed was very new. Um, most of the kids, and you kind of touched upon this as well, most of the kids who um, come to Canada for their undergrad, they end up going into business or engineering. That's where a lot of, you know, folks yeah. from India, Pakistan, Southeast Asia generally gravitate towards. Um, and I was probably one of the lone wolves in, uh, in wanting to do economics. And I initially enrolled as an economics and math uh, double major. Um, 
And uh, I eventually found my way into an economics and political science double major in my second year because I'd taken a course in political science, really loved it. Mm -hmm. But definitely a huge experience for me sitting in those classes. And again, um, I, I didn't grow up on American TV shows because I think yeah. like growing up in India in the 90s and early 2000s, um, uh, I think the mental gap was really huge in terms of, you know, not really knowing what uh, the world in the West really was all about. Uh, I think now when people, you know, come in, I think they've already seen a lot of that in the TV shows and the movies and other things. So it's a bit There's more, more access now. Yeah, it's more access. It's more familiar. Uh, but for a 17 year old um, entering a classroom for a first year 101 course in economics with 400 people in an amphitheater was like, OK, uh, this is <laughs> this is overwhelming. <laughs> it's overwhelming. Uh but um, I think one of the first things that I picked up on was that not a lot of people, at least not in Windsor at that time, um, you know, not, not, like not a lot of international students or brown people took um, economics or they didn't. Yeah. You know, I was probably like one of the one of the only ones in a political science class. Um, I think another thing that I realized was that since I was you know, in political science, there was a lot of conversations about Canadian political history that I didn't know anything about. Uh, I had to do a lot of that self-teaching on my own uh, because I wanted to participate in the class. I had thoughts, I had ideas that I wanted to share with my peers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were also a couple of kind of like rough ups that happened because I just happened to uh, have a lot thicker accent uh, mm -hmm. than, I did, than I do now. <laughs> um, and I was talking about all these grand ideas that I had about political science, about economics in class. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people Again, um, I, I think they maybe did not really feel that I deserved to be there. So mm. uh, there were a lot of like a couple of like run-ins that I had at that time. Can, can you share any instance if you remember about those run-ins? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to share one with you and your listeners, which is, sure. um, I think this was a third year uh, political science class. And the class was basically set up as... Um, like, like one of the activities in the class, like one of the main projects in the class was that we will do like a mock-up of a parliament, uh, okay. like the House of Commons, in which, we, in which we will divide basically, you know, people into two, three groups, depending on the number of parties. And uh, we will do like a roll call of issues of the day. So like the top 10 political issues. And uh, we're going to have a question period in mm -hmm. class. Okay. And that's your project. So, okay. Uh, and then the whole thing started. You have like some... Uh, 100, 150 people in the class and I um, I get called and we start and there's a bit of that kind of like two podiums and people are go kind of going at each other in the question period yeah. style. Um, and like I've been a debater. Um, I've been somebody who um, has been into public speaking for a really long time as well. So, um, and I have ideas and opinions about things. So I was kind of starting to go off and I was starting to put my points across uh, there was a lot of barbs getting exchanged. All that was good and fun, but it just, you know, it, it happened to be um, an instance in which uh, the person on the other side just ended up, you know, sneaking this thing into the conversation that, mm. uh, hey, Simran, but you have all these ideas. And it, it just kind of became a bit personal in which this person basically said, okay, Simran, you have all these ideas and you think this is what we should do, but tell me something. Let's pause and say, uh, did you even grow up here? Do you know the struggles of you know this country? And, and do you even can you even vote? And oh that God. to me was okay. very personal because mm. like obviously I'm a I'm an, I'm an international student. I'm having um, I, I still have had to kind of go through my immigration journey and everything. Like I'm not, but to me yeah. it really like put things in perspective in which I was really thrown off. Um, mm. And it took me some seconds to, you know, like fully recover from that. And that's something that I think also because I was a, I was not, I was, I was a kid at that age. I took it really personally and something that has stayed with me since. Um, but a couple of those, and there have been other instances as well uh, at, at workplace. Did you react to that in any way or you were just quiet? I think I was, I was thrown off and I was quiet. Like mm. that first time that it happened, I was really thrown off and quiet. Um, and uh it was more of like, I think, being paralyzed by 
fear almost in front of like mm. 150 people right that yeah. th- this person didn't you know like this person did not keep the conversation or the debate focused upon the issue but they made it personal and uh i think you know it's like that's when i started to kind of realize that you know what this is something that i have to just embrace uh yeah. the more that i run away from it the more it's gonna uh follow me and and really like start to you know it'll, it'll start to make me feel bad about myself um mm. there's this uh game of thrones quote um uh, i think by uh i think it's by one of the lannisters that whatever your weakness is wear that you know um uh, wear that badge? on your chest as a yeah. badge because yeah. you know uh nobody's going to make you forget about that anyway so Absolutely. you might as well just wear it as a badge right mm. so since that day i kind of realized that you know i am gonna you know deal with these issues head on um yes i might not have grown up in this country yes i might not have um you know uh, at that point in time i might not have a citizenship or the right to vote um but i'm gonna go back and really you know like learn everything that i can to really understand uh what the nuances are so uh, i think that was also i think helpful as an experience for me because it really made me go back and delve into canadian political history like mm. as a novice uh i probably uh, I, again i think i might know a lot more about canadian political history and the different kind of dynamics and the ebbs and flows much more than an average canadian can or does um <laughs> at this point right now because and i really i, I think it's i, I kind of I'm thankful for that experience for having pushed me to do that. It really Absolutely. pushed me to go into the different local communities in Windsor and, you know, other cities. And this is, you know, a pattern with me even now. Every city that I go to in Canada, um, for me, it's not just about, you know, seeing the top three sites. For me, it's like I want to know the people. I want to know mm. the history of this place. I want to know the local communities here. I want to know how people think. I want to know what their challenges are on the ground. Um, because for me, it's always that I want to, you know, I want to be more, and I think it's a bit of an overcompensation as well, definitely. Uh, but, uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that has helped me. It's definitely helped shape my worldview. Yeah. You know, I think this is such a great learning for my, for the listeners and for me as well, that how you have channelized those experiences and you, now you are calling themselves, um, an overcompensation you know <laughs> i mean i mean th- this this is something i think I, I think even for me also you know in general i think whatever i think the reason i'm able to do this podcast today simran is mm-hmm. because of those experiences i've had mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. had i not been through those comments and those criticism and and all that stuff i might not be able to put the work to make mm-hmm. sure that somebody is coming next should not face that, you know. Right. So right. I, I, I think it's it's a good learning to really channel those and not let that affect you. And mm-hmm. also you said something about, you know, wearing your weaknesses as a badge. I think it makes life so easier. You don't have to really justify or start defending mm-hmm. for things anymore, you know. Um, for example, if you have a fat nose, you have it. What can you do with that? You know, I have a lot of beard. I have a lot of beard. What can I do for that? I don't want to, because as you know, again, like this question comes my way all the time, even for the identity, if I talk about that, like, why don't you cut it? You know, or why do you wear a turban? And all those questions do come my way. But I end up telling them, I genuinely enjoy this process of getting ready. I love this, you know. I end right. up saying that to them that, I, yes, it takes time, but I genuinely enjoy my one hour in the morning, you know, for example, right. um, which yeah. definitely definitely more than that, but let's just say one hour. You. If, you're, if you're able to do that in an hour, good as you I need some tips. Uh, <laughs> no, definitely not. No, it takes more than that, especially if nowadays I'm so grateful for being up, getting the opportunity to work from home, but imagine mm-hmm. uh, it going through the same process every day. I don't even know how people <laughs> used to do that. I don't <laughs> think so I can do that. So I'd go like once a week or once in two weeks sometimes and mm-hmm. I remember right. that morning I'm up like at 5.36, you know, <laughs> doing everything yeah. and then leaving the house by like 8, 8.30. So, yeah. Right. No, I know. And I, I think there's something that you touched on that I want to quickly uh, echo is the whole authenticity piece. Um, yeah. I just feel it's, it's taken me um, a reasonably long time to arrive at this conclusion that 
the best way to live life is to just be authentic and embrace yeah. you know your shortcomings that's fine embrace your strengths as well uh not to kind of dial down and forget what your pluses are what your pros are but also be very mindful that okay these are a couple of things that i actually fall short on um and mm. i think because i think that authentic way of living life just helps you go about life in a way which um i think is better lived is more fully lived um and just makes for an overall good experience i think as opposed yeah. to kind of taking on these different identities to you know please or appease people absolutely but just wanted yeah. to touch on that but over to you so let me tell my listeners that my introduction was actually inspired by the conversation we had initially and and that you know you said something about that we as international students sometimes or most of the time not have that cushion to fall back on that or that option to go back you know just wrap everything up and go back and and we get into the zone of i cannot lose you know there's no going back and you said these few lines and which stayed with me you said that uh we we come to a, a point where where because of helplessness you said that you know if you want me to speak differently i'll do that you want mm-hmm. me to round up some rough edges i'll do that you want me to be less ambitious i'll do that just and just because i want to fit in and but then at some point you end up seeing that the person that you're seeing in the mirror is not exactly the person who it is you know it's somebody else and you have yourself you said that you hit that point pretty early in your life when you started working and and that's how you we end up talking about the topic of soul searching mm-hmm. i'm going to tell us anything and everything that you think that can help the the listeners who might be going through the similar phase and what were just your learnings throughout that experience mm-hmm. so very happy to share that and i think that's a really um interesting angle that you delve into because i think i think it's every immigrant that goes through it right um it's not that some people can just choose not to mm-hmm. typically speaking i think one thing that you've got to realize that everyone's got to realize is that we as human beings um uh, we as people in the society we are conditioned to um uh, work collaboratively and think collaboratively right that's where that whole mentality that that's that's where the whole herd mentality concept comes in the odd mm-hmm. one always sticks out right mm-hmm. so we're all programmed to mirror each other to be similar that's where that whole concept of fitting in comes from right because we don't want to be the person kind of like being that odd one that kind of sticks out that uh you know every time gets people's attention um that's a reason why i think a lot of people are not really comfortable also to think from a contrarian viewpoint right mm-hmm. so if i basically say okay that you know guru sees this is how we do things here and you are a new member of the organization who's recently been hired yeah 99% of the chances you'll be like you know what i don't want to ruffle any feathers this is how they do work here these are the rules in place and you know what they might not really align with my values but i'm just going to do it because you don't want to upset <laughs> people you want to fit yeah. in, right um in my case i think uh i as you said i i started kind of picking on these themes pretty early in which at 17 18 19 i think uh the first couple of years that i was here um a lot of those contrarian things started to come about the way that i looked uh my accent the way that i spoke um my thoughts which might not have been the best um articulated at that time uh that would not really have been reflective of the way people think um mm. um the way that I dressed even right so there were a lot of these different things that started to come up that I realized you know uh it 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 started seeping into the way that I conducted myself with people around me and for me the confusion really started uh <laughs> because for four months when the semester is going on eventually you know like i i i started talking in a certain way to be to to be actually able to better enunciate so that people can stop 
you know, asking me to repeat myself mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, I start to feel less self-conscious. Um, so I kind of like put on these different garbs just to kind of fit in. And then the funny thing that used to happen is after like a school year used to get finished and I used to go to India, mm -hmm. I'm a different Simran there. <laughs> I'm not talking in the same way. Yeah. I'm not putting on those garbs. And then when I'm there for a month or two, and then I'm coming back to Canada, <laughs> there's that dissonance happening again. So yeah. eventually, like after a couple of those cycles, um, I just kind of realized that, okay, you know what? I don't really know what's going on. My mm -hmm. identity got really mixed. And I think that's where, I think every immigrant goes through a bit of an identity crisis, right? Yeah. There are some people who are able to take it to take the move out of their home country to a new country like fish to water, you know, God bless them. Uh, I think a majority of us are not able to do it that well. Mm -hmm. People struggle with their accents. People struggle with um, the way they talk, the way they go about their lives, what they eat. A lot Absolutely. of times, you know, I've heard from a lot of people, a lot of Indians that, you know, they don't really take their home cooked food to the office yeah, um, because, you know, there's always that thing at the back of their mind that, you know what, man, this smells like curry. I don't want to be the one sitting in the <laughs> office, you know, lunchroom yeah. eating food that other people might just frown upon. Right. So there yeah. are these different things that people, you know, go through at different stages of their lives. In my case, um, a bit of that identity crisis started to creep in, um, you know, just as I turned 2021 in which um I kind of realized that, okay, and this was more when I was finishing my undergrad and I was thinking about going for my master's in which I was like, okay, uh, now I am not exactly Canadian. I don't feel Canadian because there are these people telling me that, hey, you can't vote here or you don't know about Canadian history or I'm still, you know, trying to get a grip on the accent or there, there's still so much work that I got to do to justify my place here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not Canadian enough. Okay, fine. Now I'm going to go back to India. I'm not Indian enough either. You're Indian enough. <laughs> now people over there are telling me that you've got a bit of an accent. Or they're telling yeah. me that, you know, like, your views about life have changed. Or you have changed. Yeah. Um, so what it does to the person is, <laughs> you're like, I'm neither here nor there. So where exactly am I? Yeah. Uh, that's what that whole identity crisis is all about. Uh, now this might manifest in someone else's life very differently. People who move in their early 20s, mid 20s, late 20s with their families, it might look very different for them. But this was my, this was my experience. And the way that I tried to kind of think about this was I had to unpack a lot of these different things, which is why I'm so big upon um, living in a very authentic way, um, in which there are some things which I have accepted that, you know, the color of my skin or the way that I pronounce certain words, um, that's never going to change. I don't want to change yeah. that. Um, if an accent came naturally to me, uh, I'm going to pick it up. Um, and uh, I might not talk in the same accent with my dad when I talk to him back home. Right? Yeah. And that's fine. That's okay. Like That's how it looks for me. For somebody else, it might look very different. Um, but... There, like this is who I am this is you know what I think works for me Simran and I think people need to figure that out for their own selves what really works for them how much of a concession they want to make in terms of you know adjusting their personality and where is that line for them finding mm -hmm. that line for them is what it's all about like I know as a matter of fact that okay for me the decision to keep you know the turban or my beard Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, wanting to do something for the community um, and look like the way that I do or the way that I sound, it's going to have its own set of challenges. But that's a line that I don't want to cross. I don't want to change all of this to be able to fit in there because in that case, as you said, I'm not even going to recognize myself in the mirror. Right? Yeah. Um, so I think the whole idea is to trying to find what your own individual authentic self looks like. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of that soul searching, as you said. Um, and it takes a lot of sitting down and actually saying, okay, this feels right to me. This doesn't feel right to me. It also definitely takes a lot of, you know, supportive people around you, um, mm -hmm. people who can empower you. 
your friends, your families, and I've been really lucky to have many friends who have um, reinforced in me that, you know, Simran, you're worthy, yeah. you're wanted, um, we love you the way that you are, and we don't need to change to fit in. And I think that's what really kind of gave me the power to actually be like, okay, these are the terms. Uh, there are some changes which are going to take time, which are going to come naturally. I'm not going to force them. And I'm comfortable with those changes coming in. But there are other things which I'm not going to change because I don't want to change. Those are things that make me inauthentic, right? So mm-hmm. it's just about that. I think that soul searching is also really glorified in a lot of different ways. But I think it, um, in, in, in the most simplest thing, it just means that it just means can you wake up in the mirror? Okay, can you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and realize that you know the person that you see is the person that you mostly wanted to be, right? Yeah. You see the person who is being honest and true, um, because I think that's from where everything else flows. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to live a life where I might have to make all these concessions and really change myself, and then uh, it might end up doing really well. But 20 years from now, I'm like, I don't even know. Like, there's nothing about my own self that reminds me of who I came, mm-hmm. like who I am, where I came from, right? So it's just about figuring out what works for you um, and uh, sticking sticking to that with with guts, right? Because yeah. uh, another, another kind of thing that I believe in that I often tell myself, or that I used to tell myself a lot more every time I used to feel down is, you got to have guts, man. No guts, no glory. You got to mm. like stick to your guts. You got to stick to your guns. Um, you got to figure out what works for you and uh, be unapologetic about it. I think in the most, in, in most instances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. man. I love that. And now a few things I just want to highlight before we get into the final segments. You said that try to find your unique definition of identity, your two to right. self. Second, you said is, you know, find a support system who can actually mm-hmm. acknowledge and, and tell you that what you're doing is right and it makes you stop questioning yourself all the time. And the final one, obviously, no, no guts, no glory. So that would be my yeah. takeaway for lawlessness. Yeah. Beautiful. So, Simran, so before we get into the final segment, is there anything you think that I have not covered that you would like to mention? Uh, no, I think you've covered almost everything. You asked me about uh, my life, Canada, what made me think about Canada? You made me open up um, and provide a safe space in which I might have actually overshared. So, at the risk <laughs> of not <laughs> revealing too much because I'm a fairly private person, um, okay. I'm going to say you covered most of it. So, before we get into the final last segment, I have included this new segment in this season and I call mm-hmm. it Know Your Host, where I give my guests an opportunity to ask me any question they would, they would like. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Um, give me a couple of seconds to think. No tough questions, please. No, no, I'm not going to. I'm not <laughs> going to make it too, super tough. <laughs> Curious to know how you take these questions on uh, from people because, you know, I have a very unique way and a very unique approach that I've kind of developed. Um, but I want to hear from you anytime. And I think you live in, you, you live in Montreal, right? Yes, I so, do. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think... Um, my, my my question to you almost is that how do you anytime people get fascinated with a turban and they ask you questions about the turban what are some of the most intriguing questions that you've received uh and how and, and how have you answered them oh my god i love this question because i do get that question a lot uh you you said it very correctly um Obviously, I think it stemmed right from the time I landed in Canada, which was in my class, you know, uh, and I was right. the only Indian and the only Sikh person that was wearing person. I think initially people were a little hesitant to ask me anything because they didn't know mm-hmm. me. But eventually, after like three, four months, they started noticing and uh, noticing the colors of my turban. And mm-hmm. I am a little bit... Uh, 
uh, the, one of those who like to dress up. I think we all right. Sikhs in general, you know, like to match their turbans accordingly. And I'm like one of those. And every time I would go, every time I, I could see those eyes, you know, staring at me and and my turban. And then eventually I remember my professor started, uh, who, 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 got, who was got really, really friendly with us. And he started, he used to, used to call me guru. And each time yeah. I ent- entering the class and uh, for some reason I was always late. <laughs> I was like one of those, you know, when I was younger. And I remember entering the class and the class would start at like 10 a.m. And I would be there for like 10, 5 or 10, 10. And I remember every time this line would come my way, there's like, oh, here is Guru. Always fashionably late, you know. So this this line would come my way. And the same happens with my office. Not that I'm late anymore. I'm pretty punctual. But the same question comes my way in, in the office. And right. the same statement I meant. So the question that comes my way all the time is that does the colors of your turban mean anything? Always. Right, right. And I always tell them that in general, the colors of turban doesn't mean that much. And I always wear something that aligns the best with my outfit. That's all. Right. And But right. there are certain colors, you know, like reds, which are worn on uh, the weddings, for example, you know, in the Sikh weddings. Right. It was mm-hmm. it was traditionally worn. Now things are changing. The pastel colors are kind of coming mm-hmm. in. Uh, when the other colors like, you know, maybe uh, orange or the mm-hmm. the navy blue or, or even the yellow, those are worn like on certain uh, traditional or religious festivals that we wear on. Mm-hmm. So this is some this is how usually I uh, answer them but in general the colors doesn't mean that much and you I just go mm-hmm. along whichever color I feel that day in. <laughs> that's how no, that's amazing. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That, that's that's really nice because I think um, and you know th- through your podcast that's something else uh, that I want to just get that word out on that a lot of times um, the questions are not meant to be personal they're not meant to personally attack you. They're coming from a place of intrigue. They're, meant, they're coming from a place of genuine curiosity. So the idea is to, for everyone to learn, and this is not just immigrants, it's, you know, I think it's a, it's, it's a really important skill to just know anyway for anyone, which is to know how to disarm someone in a conversation, right? So if somebody asks mm-hmm. you, you know, like, I've also gotten similar questions like, do the colors mean anything? Uh, I've seen other people with different styles. Is that different? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> how many, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, loves do you have and everything? How many layers <laughs> do you have? Like, does that mean, does it, you know, come, does it change by age and all that? Really, like, curious questions. And to me, I kind of look, look to those questions as opportunities for me to really educate uh, and share what this is all about, right? Because I think if, 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 if people take it personally or if they end up being shy, um, that per- you're basically leaving an opportunity on the table for someone to, act, to genuinely know what this is all about. Yeah. So learn how to disarm. It's a friendly conversation. Be engaging. And um, don't be shy to kind of take these questions on. I think these yeah. are, uh, it could be turban for us. It could be, you know, a hijab for someone, it could be a kippah for someone else, but the whole idea basically being that just these are important identity markers that we choose to, you know, adorn on ourselves as a part of who we are, mm-hmm. and we got to be unapologetic about it, and if somebody has a question, feel free to answer, you know, like, feel, feel free to engage them in that conversation, and if you find yourself not being able to answer, then sit back and really question yourself why you wear it. Mm. right i think that's the other piece like why exactly do you wear a turban i think that's Mm -hmm. that to you then becomes an important question to you to ask yourself to really kind of understand so anyway it's going to be something that you'll end up benefiting from yeah yeah oh my god this question has woken up like a certain um chapter in my mind you know which was just not talked about in so so long and when you said the term unarmed i can totally back that because Obviously, like, you know, and you can see that people staring at you or your third burn or your beard. You can see that, you know, you might, they might not look directly into your eye, but you can feel that certain Mm -hmm. sort of tension between you and the other person. And I think that's where I don't know somehow how I learned that or how I do that. I don't even know. But the thing which I actually introspected on was I do try to 
bring people to that comfort level so that they are open to ask me those questions and i right. do that by asking them a lot of questions you know or maybe about mm. their family a bit about their house maybe about their career i i ask them a lot of questions i bring them at like a safe space a certain mm. proximity i try to build so that they can ask me those questions so i try to do right. that and speaking of questions again uh, i completely skipped telling you in in by answering the question that you asked me that in my final presentation of my program the program i started right. at la salle college there was a course which was called the communication and the presentation course and in that we were asked to present anything like anything that okay. i would like to do that and i remember like in my uh, we were supposed to do like two presentations one presentation was about india i actually learned a lot about india just researching right. and preparing for that obviously mm-hmm. and second thing my second presentation the final presentation which absolutely was was you know acclaimed by praised by everybody and that presentation was about the 13 questions i get asked about my thermal that was my oh, presentation that's amazing and i ans- and i still have the recording of that the presentation i built i have it maybe somewhere down the line i'll release that to my for my listeners so if anybody would like to share i would love to share that on instagram but yes i answered those 13 questions to the point that in my final questions where they asked me that how do i tie a thermal i could not show them the whole process but i did take along a uh, one of my turbans and i showed them that it's actually 7.5 meters long and you right. do that certain process of folding it which is mm-hmm. pony we call it in mm-hmm. punjabi and i showed them how i do that and then a little bit of like a demonstration of how i sort of like tie it so i actually showed them and i think it was really really appreciated by everybody and i think Amazing. each one of my classmates came to me and they told me oh my god like we loved this but even my professor you know she came to me right. and i think i got the full grades i mean no doubt obviously <laughs> but i got full grades on that yeah that's amazing and i think like kudos to you for having that you know strength of character to actually share something so personal with everyone mm-hmm. um yeah. because yes it's uh, a lot of times i think at least that's been my experience a lot of these questions come from a genuine place of curiosity right Absolutely. you really want to know and yeah. uh, that that's a that's a terrific technique that i uh, that i want to acknowledge which is uh, one of the great ways to disarm somebody is to actually ask them questions so that they feel yeah. they're comfortable to ask you back and so yeah really yeah. really fascinating Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for these questions. I love that. So, so now we're in the final segment of the podcast. I call it Beneath the Accent. I'm going to ask a couple of okay. questions. You can answer them in one word or a sentence or however you feel like. The idea is okay. just to know more about Simran. So, ready? Okay. Absolutely. First is what advice would you give to your younger self and at what age? Be authentic, trust the process at I would say age 18, 19. Okay. What's that one dish from your home country that always brings you comfort and nostalgia? Ooh. Okay, so uh, since I told you that my mom is from Bihar, uh that that that's where she grew up. Um mm-hmm. I've grown up on a lot of uh, Bihari food. Um it it has to be boiled rice with yellow dal. Mm. Um and then maybe some uh uh it's called alu chokha which is basically mashed potatoes on the side uh, okay. so that's going to probably be it yeah okay awesome making me hungry already <laughs> okay <laughs> describe a moment when you experienced a significant cultural difference that surprised you interesting i think this was probably the first time that i was invited to uh one of my white friends's house for thanksgiving mm-hmm. and uh just kind of like seeing that dynamic within their family Mm. um and how you know everybody kind of went about you know though that that interpersonal relationship and this was me at 18 probably mm. um that to me was uh that to me just kind of made me think about the way that we do that in a lot of southeast asian cultures and uh yeah. it, it's really like i think both of those are really warm uh but there was a bit of a difference there so that's something that came to mind Do you have any instance any funny story related to your misunderstanding around the accent or English? So my name is Simran Zeet, uh Simran Zeet with a Z. Um but I go by Simran. That's what uh I go by in conversations. So um a lot of times I've heard different variations of Simran from people. Uh I've heard Simran, I've heard Simran <laughs> uh, yeah. I've heard different kind of like mispronunciations like uh for the longest time 
um, Starbucks uh, used to mess up the name that they used to put on the cups. And then probably there were enough Simrons who came in the downtown Toronto core that they finally were able to <laughs> figure it out. But, um, but I've heard so many different variations of this name. Uh, it's, it's, it's not even funny. And, you know, it's also funny that a lot of times um, uh, I think Microsoft Outlook or Microsoft Word um, autocorrect Simran to Simon. <laughs> so <laughs> there have been many okay. emails in which it's been, hey, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm like, man, this is not even like, ask Simon to finish this job for you. This was not meant for me. Uh, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's something that came to mind. Okay. For me, the, the spellings are always correct. It's always a pronunciation which goes from Gurasis to Gurasis, Gurasis, Jurasis. So yeah. that, that's where my pronunciation goes to. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your first friend that you made in Canada. And are you still in Connect? Oh, that's that's so that, that's so beautiful. So that's such a beautiful question. Um, yes, the first friend that I did make in Canada was um, this friend from Chandigarh, actually, who, mm-hmm. who happened to be a fellow international student who I had met. Um, so, you know, universities, I think they still do. They have these international student centers uh in university so i think there was like a welcome night for international students that was that you know this place in windsor was organizing and i met my friend his name is rohan khanna i met him there and uh yeah we're still in touch we 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 lost touch for a couple of years uh i think from 2015 to 2018 2019 Mm -hmm. and then we reconnected back in 2020 and then we've been uh we've been in touch so shout out to Rohan. He's in India vacationing right now. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, we were still in touch. Okay, awesome. What's that uh, one tradition that you have adopted, like a Canadian tradition that you have adopted? Uh, it's going to probably be opening conversations up with asking about the weather. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I uh, love that answer. Just because I think it's something that I was just mentioning this to uh, someone back home. I think it was my parents or somebody else. Uh, but how in India, you know, we we never really check the weather. We don't talk about the weather that much. It just yeah. is what it is, and you just kind of take yeah. it at face value. You, you just like get get it, get accustomed to it. But I think it has it is such a thing here in Canada, and I think rightfully so because the weather here changes so quickly. Um, then everybody's always on their phone looking at, you know, what the latest prediction is. Um, and I think it just ends up finding its way into conversations as well. So yeah, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be opening up conversations by talking about it, just <laughs> publicly musing about the weather. Yeah. I just realized I do that a lot too. I do ask <laughs> a lot about the weather. And I think if, uh, the amount of times I've asked Siri that what's the weather outside, right, right. I think <laughs> if she could really be a human she would snap at me that stop asking about the weather every single day <laughs> i know right <laughs> yeah crazy oh my god okay um what's something that you ate for the first time in canada uh it has to be the turkey dinner uh mm-hmm. at thanksgiving so uh you know the place that used to kind of have like the food court at the university um did the special thing um thanksgiving 2011 uh mm-hmm. in which they they, they they kind of served the turkey they served the potatoes the stuffing and everything mm, the cranberry yes. sauce and um uh, that to me was just like wow it was like a a net new kind of yeah. uh, food experience and um uh, something that i actually took quite a liking to so mm. that was the first time that i ate that in in canada mm. i actually tried that two years ago for the first time and i thoroughly enjoyed it too yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. If you had to describe yourself as an animal or any creature, what would it be and why? There are so many that come to mind, but I probably am going to go with uh, an eagle or a hawk. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the one that I identify with the most right now, um, like in this stage of my life, in which there's still a bit of that independence. Um, mm. If you know, like going about life and, you know, living it, you know, on my own terms. On my terms, yeah. Um, also being very authentic. Um, and really looking at things from perspective um, and 
Yeah, a bit of that kind of like going with the flow. Because, you know, eagles and hawks, they don't really flap their wings too much. A lot of it is, you know, just trusting the process and uh, seeing where the wind takes them and just course correcting along the way. So I'm going to say probably that, yeah, eagle or yeah. hawk. I love that. Okay. If you could, if you had to create one law that everybody has to follow, what would it be? Uh, in Canada or like in general, generally? any law in general. for for the world? Genuinely speaking, uh, making some part of your week mandatory for community service, hundred mm-hmm. uh, percent. Just because I think it a it's going to get a lot of people out of their homes and interacting with people that they generally don't interact with. Okay. Uh, so a lot of that, you know, cultural knowledge exchange mm-hmm. that happens. I genuinely believe that, that, you know, like doing something for others without expecting anything in return is one of the ways to genuinely experience that joy that if you've not mm-hmm. done it, you won't really know what I'm talking about. But if you've done it, it's a different kind of an experience. And I think everyone deserves mm-hmm. to feel that at least once in their life. And I think third is it also will, I think, hopefully, it might be hard for people because it's a law that they need to follow, but eventually it might just become a force of habit, but just paying it forward, you know? Mm. Uh, And I think I I very strongly believe that only if we could, um, you know, have more people-to-people interactions within the community in which, you know, I'm meeting people who have a very different viewpoint than myself and I'm meeting them over, I don't know, like a street cleanup, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, Conversations are meant to happen. Bridges are meant to be built. Uh, I just think it's going to, at the very least, you know, make us better as a society. So I'm going to probably say, yeah, mandatory community service in some way, shape or form on a weekly or monthly basis. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Finally, describe Canada in one word or a sentence. Home uh, is what mm. I'm going to go with. Um, and okay. uh, the reason why I say that, and this has been, again, something that I remember from the first time that I came back from my first vacation to India and that I stayed with me is, and that's, and that's you know, um, why I've come to love this country so much. Um, because this country has... Um, help me find my own self um, and it's also really provided me with those connections those people um, it really really embodies that ethos of mm-hmm. doing something for others and being kind right um, so the reason why I said home is because um, and, and this is something that I've loved every single time that I've you know come back uh, from a foreign country into Canada that whenever the CBSF officer um, it takes your passport and they do everything. You you could be a student, you could be on a visitor visa, you could be yeah. you know permanent resident or a citizen. They say welcome home. Welcome home. Yeah, absolutely. And that is so it's it's really warm. It really like talks about what Canada is all about, which is it's welcoming, um, and it really is. It's it's kind in the way that you know it sees people kind of coming in and. Uh, adding to the vibrancy of the culture and the economy. So, uh, yeah, Canada is home, man. Okay. Yeah. So, Simran, if you could leave me with one piece of advice, what would it be? I'd probably say uh, it's 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 great that you've started this community through you know my thick accent podcast and your listeners tune in. Uh, my, my advice to you will be to not give up on storytelling in any way, shape, or form, right? It could be through a podcast today. It could be through uh, other means and avenues, you know, mm. next week, next month, coming years as you get more busy. Never stop telling stories um, because I think you, you personally, I think uh, having interacted with you over the course of this podcast and previously as well, I think you have a real um, talent with telling stories, shaping stories. Um, and uh, for somebody out there who might not really have the access to come and meet people like you and me, mm-hmm. 
it's easy for them to tune into the podcast and you know be a part of our lives and share and get a you know sliced sliced version of our lives and you know get to experience it vicariously um and i think that's really powerful that's really mm. um something that can really help move the needle if people can understand that you know the experiences that i'm having as an immigrant uh simran and gurasis and other people who've been on the podcast have had similar experiences i think that validation goes a long way in terms of giving them that uh um bit of confidence that self belief um so i think you're doing a terrific job in terms of you know telling these stories and my advice will be that never stop telling stories just make sure that if if you've been chosen um if you have chosen <laughs> this path for yourself to tell these stories just make sure that it always remains a part of you know what you do um because you don't know who you might be influencing in what way um and uh yeah that's going to probably be it yeah Wow, I think once again I'm so impressed the way you articulate your thoughts Simran but uh, thank you thank you for all your kind words I really appreciate that and finally tell me how would you describe your experience of being on this podcast Oh it was amazing good to see you've been a very gracious host um you made me think about um you you kind of made me uh introspect and you know go back and you know think about things you know what i was like growing up in india and then when i moved here and um uh, just refreshed and jogged my memory um uh, i think you also went into like certain areas you kind of like delved into certain areas which i don't think a lot of people a lot of hosts or a lot of question like interviewers go into um mm-hmm. and uh for me the highlight was that it was a very human conversation right mm-hmm. it was a conversation which was um definitely about my experience and you know what kind of my trials and tribulations were what my successes were etc cetera, etc cetera. but um it was also about uh you i really like the way that you drew out uh pieces about you know different pieces about how i thought about things or how you summarized that towards the end so it's been it's been fantastic and again kudos to you for um doing this and uh doing this for the community well thank you thank you for being on the podcast and adding value to my listeners and thank you for being so open about all the stories and experiences that you have shared with me and my listeners so thank you thanks a lot it's been a pleasure to see thank you and thanks everyone <laughs>